A little over a year ago, I posted a video by Dr. Richard Oster of Harding School of Theology talking about 1 Corinthians 11 and head coverings. A lot of you have asked about practical implications and applications of what he's teaching. Well, it just so happens I reached out to Dr. Oster to get some follow-up on this, and he just presented at the Harding Lectureship this year information that will surely bless you when it comes to 1 Corinthians 11 and understanding not just what Paul is talking about archaeologically, historically, culturally, but also the implications that that has for us today in terms of women's roles, egalitarianism versus complementarianism, and, and how that all works out with 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So I'm very excited to present this, and I hope you'll be able to watch it all the way to the end. Uh, there's a link to the first video in uh, the description, so if you haven't watched that one yet, please check that out. Enjoy. Well, welcome. I was told to introduce myself. So um, I'm Rick Oster. I am a professor at Harding School of Theology in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, of course, part of Harding University, the seminary for Harding University, and uh, been there since the late 1970s. So, uh, not too long, just about just about right, just about right. So, uh, glad you're here, and we're going to be looking at some issues related to 1 Corinthians 11, and what it says there about um, the role of women and their participation. Uh, in the service, the church service, and in particular some archaeological information that as of, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago uh, was brought to bear on this text in terms of trying to get it sort of moved off of uh, just being stuck where it had been for quite some time in terms of trying to get a better grasp of, of what's going on. So let me start by saying that uh, because of the use of the word assembly or uh, assemblies or congregations in the closing verse of this section, which I think goes down through verse 16, chapter 11, verses 2 through 16, that uh, Paul is talking about something that has to do with when Christians assemble, and it has to do with men and women being together, or there would not be such an interest in men and women in this section, um, if you look in the Pauline letters, this is the text that has the greatest concentration of the two gender-specific terms, uh, man and woman, or depending on translations, it might say husbands and wives, but if you use Greek, it's aner and gune. Uh, this is the greatest concentration of those two terms in the Pauline corpus, and so I think what Paul is interested in here, here is a gender discussion as it intersects with worship not a discussion about uh, social status. Some scholars think this is about social status, social hierarchy. Uh, Paul knows the terms about the haves versus the have-nots and those kind of conversations. In fact, he does it about the Lord's Supper, which is about to be talked about next. He doesn't use any of that language in this section. Uh, nor is it about primarily about uh, hair length, head coverings, uh, per se, okay? Uh, the, the issue of the head covering uh, is sort of the occasion for him to need to, to, need to talk about this. Uh, let me just clarify, um, because we've become in the last 40, 50 years more aware in our culture about uh, particularly the Islamic faith and facial veils. That's not the kind Paul is talking about. He's talking about a covering that's on the head, okay, and sort of comes down over the years. He's not talking about a facial veil. He does use that word over in 2 Corinthians 3 when he's talking about the veil that covers Moses' face, that, that story. That's not what he's talking about here. Okay, so uh, 1 Corinthians is constructed around uh, a series of sort of problem issues Paul has to deal with. And uh, the first four chapters are about fragmentation, divisions in the church, Five and six are about uh, basically sexual immorality issues, et cetera, et cetera, and how this works out. So we get to chapters uh, 11, 12, 13, 14. These are about issues that have to do with when Christians are together for what we would call worship, okay? What we would call worship. And uh, some people don't agree with that for the first part of this section. They don't think... Uh, chapter 11, verses 2 through 16 is about that. I, I think it is because of use of the word assembly in verse 16 and just the fact that all the other occasions in this section 
are about when women and men get together. And we're going to see that prophecy is referred to here, just as we begin this issue, prophecy is referred to. And we know that prophecy is a gift exercised for the whole church. When Paul really wants to discuss prophecy in chapters uh, 13 and 14 in particular, he makes it clear that prophecy is a gift to be exercised in the church, for the whole church, he says. Okay, those are just some preliminary things. And uh, so I want to um, primarily focus on just this cultural, historical information we're more aware of now that shed new light on this text. Uh, and we all know that Corinth is located geographically in Greece, I think, right? What we call the country of Greece in, in Paul's time was divided into two Roman provinces. Uh, but even though Corinth in, is in Greece, culturally it's no longer in Greece. Um, the city was conquered by the Romans in uh, the middle of the second century before Christ. And for just a little over 100 years, basically was unoccupied by anyone. And then in 44 BC, certainly before the Ides of March, because that's when Caesar was assassinated, uh, but Julius Caesar, sometime in early 44 BC, uh, reestablished the city after it had been not totally unoccupied, but it wasn't recognized as a city, um, as a Roman colony. So what are colonies? And by the way, this is not the only colony mentioned in the New Testament. There are other Roman colonies mentioned. Um, colonies are little sort of microcosms of what the city of Rome is supposed to be. It's a, an outpost for Roman language, Roman religion, Roman civilization. Just like the capital city, it doesn't mean that everyone who lives there has to be Roman, but it does mean it would be foolish to think you can interpret what's going on in the city without being aware of the fact that it is designed and set up by Julius Caesar to be an outpost for Roman civilization, religion, culture, language, those kind of things. That means we need to be especially attentive to things that are Roman as we think about possible backgrounds for interpreting this text. Now, we've been a little bit at a disadvantage in terms of appreciating Roman kinds of things because none of the New Testament's written in Latin. How about that, right? I mean, it's the Roman Empire, right? And there's plenty of Roman literature, plenty of Roman artifacts, plenty of Roman inscriptions, statuary, coins. But it just so happens that none of the New Testament is in Latin. So New Testament scholars historically just sort of played like. There was nothing in the huge Latin world, even though it was in the Roman Empire, that was of that much significance. Okay? But that was in sort of a false direction. All right. So um, let's look at the text for a few minutes, and then we'll look at some slides here. Verse 2 is where this section begins. And we don't have time to do verse by verse, obviously. Uh, he says, I commend you. And that's in contrast to what's in verse 17, where he says, I do not commend you. So these are connected sections, but the tenor of them is quite different. He's got problems with the believers in both sections, but the magnitude of the problems is a lot different. Okay, and so in this first issue, uh, he says, I do commend you, even though he's got to correct him about some stuff, but nothing compared to the second thing, which is about the Lord's Supper, where he says, I cannot commend you, I will not commend you. In fact, tells them before that section's over, if they don't change their ways, they will be judged along with the world. Okay, judged along with the world. And of course, that outcome is pretty unacceptable if you're a believer. Then verse 3, I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ and the head of a of man uh, the head of woman is man and the head of Christ is God now translations start getting a little slippery here in verse 2 I'm sorry verse 3 on how to translate this these Greek terms for man and woman husband and wife um, because the words can mean either okay um, what I do have a problem with is translations who can't make up their mind Okay, and so they lead me to believe they're just picking and choosing which one goes along with their theology. 
And so part of it'll be, they'll take part of the verse to be, well, on air refers to men. Well, with this other part of the verse, it refers to husbands. And they want to read this inappropriately through an epistle Paul hasn't even written yet, which is Ephesians chapter 5. Okay. So uh, my own view is, is that on air means man, okay, in these opening verses, and that gune means woman. Doesn't mean husband, doesn't mean wives. But if it does, you surely need to translate it that way consistently. Okay. So I think this verse 3, Paul is laying this sort of foundational theological principle about the way God created some structures of the universe and creation. And one of them reflects this divine nature of the relationship between the Father and the Son. And uh, we know from 1 Corinthians 15 that the Son will eternally be in submission to the Father. And so we're not going to be shocked that the term head has some sense of leadership, authority, uh, that people are submissive to the one who is the head. Uh, By the way, this is the only passage in Paul where the relationship between the father and son is described with this word head. Okay, this is the only place that occurs. All right, so we get to verse 4. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head now um, for most of the modern era uh, and by that I mean all the way back to the you know Protestant movement beginning of the Protestant movement it was pretty typical for people to look at this and say you know we don't know what Paul's referring to about men having their heads covered even a very uh, important significant erudite scholar like Gordon Fee in his commentary said well we don't have any evidence of uh, male head coverings and anything to do with society back then you know we don't have any literature that refers to it we don't have any artifacts that refer to it and while Gordon Fee is a really bright scholar in many many areas he was just absolutely wrong in that one okay we have a ton of information and it just proves that none of us knows everything okay and Gordon Fee was you know, uh, incredibly educated in ways that, you know, I try not to open my mouth about. And sometimes when I do, I sort of put my foot in and quickly try to tell myself, don't do that again. You know, just admit you're ignorant. Uh, But he just spoke about an area he just didn't know much uh, about. So what I want to do here at the beginning is just to expose you to uh, the prevalence and pervasive nature of male head coverings in what was the dominant empire of Rome and so all the Pauline letters all the Petrine letters uh, the Johannine letters the Jesus letters and the book of Revelation all of those are written in the Roman Empire they're all written in the Roman Empire and it's just been easy for us to forget that because you know the New Testament happens to be in Greek so let's quickly look at some of these I don't have time to sort of explain all of these to you in terms of sort of archaeological precision. Okay, that's not the goal here. It's just to expose you to some variety and make just some general observations about head coverings. Okay, now you see under the title Roman worship head coverings, you see a little Latin phrase there, capito, wellato. That just means with head covered. This is a Latin phrase that was used to describe this technique of having the head covered. Okay, and so if you want to see more pictures than the few I have, just not now, some other time, just type that into your Google, right, (laughs) search, and it will bring up some inappropriate pictures. But it will bring up a lot of helpful archaeological pictures showing the very kind of things I'm trying to show you here. All right, so here is a Julius Caesar, right, coin. So this goes back to the Roman Republic. And this is what the head covering looked like that Paul's talking about and then part and parcel of the Roman uh, religious experience. Now this particular coin, this is a coin, the study of coins is called numismatics. The person who does that is a numismatist. Okay, Ancient coins had heads and tails just like ours. This is called an obverse and a reverse. That's what they call it, scholars call it, obverse reverse. So this is the obverse. And so you see in front of his neck, you see a thing that looks like a maybe a shepherd's shepherd's crook or staff or something. Uh, That was a icon from 
the world of prophecy, Roman prophecy. That was called an augur's wand. Augur's wand, and that shows up in the pictures of Roman prophecy at times. And then behind him, on this picture, you see a cap. Whether it looks like to you like a cap or not, that's a cap used in Roman religious officials when they were giving prophecies. So this picture has three visual symbols that have to do with, among other things, prophecy. Because in Roman religion, you wore this head covering, unless it was raining, you could wear it any time you wanted to, it was raining. But in religious context, you would wear it when you were prophesying, when you were praying, which is two of the things Paul mentions in these verses, and then the third time is when sacrifice was being offered. And of course, Christian religions, unlike most of the rest of them, it's a day and age, and it's primitive times. Uh, Christianity didn't offer sacrifices because these sacrifices have been offered. But Roman religion, Greek religion, Egyptian religion, Jewish religion, uh, they all offered sacrifices frequently. And in Roman religion, these three icons went along with sacrifice, prayer, and prophecy. Two of those three are mentioned in our verse. This is another coin. This is a, another Roman person. Uh, here's Augustus, so now we're in the imperial period, the first Roman emperor. This is a statue of Augustus. Most of the evidence I'm going to be showing you is about men, just like most of the literature in the ancient world was written by who? By men, right, that we have. And so most of the statuary and all this other stuff come from men. And so don't let that mislead you, though, because women also did this, okay? Um, it was pervasive throughout the culture that was Roman. If you were a Roman, you didn't have to be a high official. Most of these are high officials. Why is that? Because they're the only ones that could pay for these kind of monuments. Okay? But the little bitty people, the hoi polloi, they did the same thing. And you're thinking, well, how do we know that if only the high officials left the statuary and stuff? It's in the literature. The literature talks about how pervasive it is. And, okay, all right. Uh, this is from Arapacus, a very famous monument. If you've been to Rome, maybe you were taken on a tour that included this altar of peace. And this is a, just a vignette from that um, mural, carved mural that goes around part of the altar of peace. And they're sort of going to church here. This is sort of like going to church in Rome. Um, and, you know, you're covered. If you're going to be part of the ceremony of sacrifice or prayer or prophecy or any combination of that, you're going to have this. And so in the guy, you see the person uh, got the axe. That's part of the sacrificial iconography is you have an axe because somebody has to kill that ox, right, or lamb or whatever. Uh, this is from the same altar of peace. This is a scene of Aeneas uh, making it back to Italy, establishing Rome. And you see the big picture of Aeneas there with his head covered, offering a sacrifice. This is a standard, you know, statue, and you see this... Uh, a lot of statues of this. Some of them are, pictures like this are on coins. Some are on altar monuments. This is just a freestanding statue um, with a small dish. That's called a fiale. And uh, it's the one mentioned habitually in the book of Revelation when it talks about bowls, bowls of wrath. You know that bowl? That's this, what this is. It's not a deep bowl. It's not like a salad bowl. Okay, it's more like a saucer. Okay, and so next time you read through the book of Revelation, and uh, read about bowls of wrath or whatever, uh, they're not thinking about a deep bowl. They're thinking about something that looks like what this priest has in his hand. Okay? And you notice he's got on the liturgical, the worship head covering. This particular statue was found actually in the Roman city of Corinth. And these monuments, I'm showing you, come from all over the empire. The coins, of course, are circulated all over the empire. So it's not like these are just in the capital or just in Italy. They're the Roman Empire. So anywhere there are Roman people, there's just there's a concentration of them in Roman colonies. Okay. This is an important sacrifice that Rome had. Uh, sort of details are laid out on how to do it. And you see you've got a, a pig there, right, and then a lamb, and then an ox. And I want to show you here, notice not everybody who's at the ceremony is veiled. This is important for my understanding of 1 Corinthians 11. Not everybody in the assembly is veiled. And, that, and Paul says, if you just look at the text, it's the person who is praying or prophesying who is covered. So, sorry for those older sisters who thought they were supposed to put their hat on when they came into the church building. 
or at camp when all the young boys are told to take their caps off when you pray, right? All that goes back to this verse, these verses. This was never anything that Paul imagines or is in part of Roman culture that has to do with everybody wearing one. It's the people who are involved sort of in leading the ceremony. Okay, and so sometimes it's only one person at the altar. Sometimes you might see a couple of people around the altar. But it's unusual to find everybody around the altar when it's an altar scene who's covered. And that's because they're not all sort of active participants in the altar. And that's why, and it's really clear in the Greek of 1 Corinthians 11, when a, you know, male, when a man prays or prophesies, doesn't, Paul doesn't say when you go into the assembly, when you go into the church building, and what's talking about the women, it doesn't say when you go shopping or you go to the well, or it's when she prays or prophesies. It's very specific about the activity he or she's involved in that Paul is trying to interact with. And so that's why in some of these, you'll see only one or two people in a larger scene that actually has on the head covering. All right. Here's another one. Uh, Okay. Um, here's one of a little sort of, uh, sort of like a zip code, zip code or neighborhood worship association priests getting together here. And you see, whenever you see animals like this, these poor little animals, they don't know. They're, they're about to be slaughtered, okay? They're there for the sacrifice. That's not somebody's pet or something, okay? They, they didn't bring their pet to church. This is somebody who's, you know, an animal that's about to be sacrificed. Okay, and so uh, this particular one, uh, you can see more than one person is covered, and you see the, the praise band is in the background there. The guy's got a loot or something? Okay, so they, they had it. Another, okay? And you can see from this profile picture, it was, again, basically supposed to come down sort of over cover the ear. Okay, just to cover the ear. Uh, this, you know, muscular guy back there by the animal, that's called a wictamarius, and that is an attendant, because if you had you know, much in the way of a big animal there, they had to have an attendant or a person to help you with the sacrifice. And usually the way they did that, because if you just slit that animal's throat, there's going to be blood everywhere, there's going to be, it's going to be a huge mess. And so they have sacrificial attendants who would um, usually smack them between the eyes to sort of stun them or knock them out. And then they could, you know, on large animals, they didn't care about a pigeon or something. But if it was a big animal like that, that if you slit its throat, you know, you might get more damage than it would before it was over. Um, so that's who that, if you see this muscular looking people in some of these pictures, that's who that is. That's a victimarius, victimarius, and it's a sacrificer. Okay, and that's why he looks so strong, is he's got to be able to sort of manhandle uh, that animal. Here's another one. This is an altar from the Temple of Vespasian. Uh, we think it's a Temple of Vespasian. Anyway, that's how it's labeled usually. In Pompeii. And so we know this one has to be before A.D. when? When was Pompeii destroyed? 79, right. Right, August. We're not sure of exact date, you know. It's not like somebody's watch, you know, or calendar was frozen in place, but they think it's around August of 79. Uh, so anyway, this was covered up after the eruption of Vesuvius. All right, another one. All right, another one. Um, here's, you know, we're about out of this. I, but I've tried to show you altars. I've tried to show you reliefs. I've tried to show you statuary. I've tried to show you numismatic evidence. Okay. Uh, this is Marcus Aurelius, a mid, late second century Roman emperor. And you notice he's the one that's got the head covering on. And again, you notice here the animal sort of peering into the scene, not knowing what's about to happen. But that animal will be sacrificed, and you have a little accompaniment here. Um, but he's the only one that I see that's got the head covering. All right. Uh, all right, we're going to stop with that for the moment. So that is what I, and, and right now most scholars think this is pretty reasonable, kind of... Um, interpretation of what's going on. Okay, so if this is the dominant culture, and in the Church of God in Corinth, we have people there who are Jewish background. We have people who are Roman background. We have people who are Greek background. Okay, we have people from Africa. Apollos, right? 
We have Priscilla and Aquila, and, and he's from, you know, north central Turkey, right on the coast of the Black Sea. Just go across the Black Sea, right? And there we have Russia and Ukraine. And by the way, there were first century synagogues on the north side of the Black Sea where Crimea is, Russia and Ukraine. They got first century synagogues up there. So, anyway, we've, we, there's a real mix there in the Church of God in Corinth and these house churches. And so the people from Roman culture, many of them would just keep on worshiping with a lot of patterns that they had before. And one of those patterns were, is that men would pray and prophesy with their heads covered. And that's a problem, not to them, of course, because their view is it's unisex, right? In Roman culture, this head covering was unisex. Men and women wore it identically. For Paul and everybody else, even though it's the Roman Empire, not everybody's Roman. And so we have Greek authors, Greek author named Plutarch, He says, this is really peculiar that the Romans do this. They should know that men should have their heads uncovered because having a head covering on is sort of a sign of submissiveness and those men shouldn't be wearing those. And Paul and everybody else in the Mediterranean world disagrees with what Plutarch says or Plutarch agrees with what Paul says, though I'm not sure either one had read the other one. Um, In fact, I'm sure Paul did not read Plutarch, (laughs) okay? Um, But in any case, This is sort of the background when you have people who, because of their culture and their history, it just seems a normal thing, okay, for the men and women to be covered when they sacrifice and pray and prophesy. And so now that they've become Christians and they've gotten rid of those beliefs and all those gods and goddesses and they don't sacrifice anymore, they still pray and prophesy. Judaism had women prophets. Roman religion had women prophets. Christian religion had women prophets. Uh, Greek religion had women prophets. But there's a problem because this practice, as Paul depicts it here in verse 3 and 4, it is a disgrace because visually, notwithstanding what the people doing it may or may not think, Paul is telling them that this is um, confusing the theology that goes back to Um, sort of the creation of the universe, which is in verse 3, that God is the head of man, man is the head of woman, God is the head of Christ. Now, that language of submissiveness really goes against everything we believe and hold dear as Americans. It doesn't bother the kingdom of God a single bit, right? Submissiveness is a noble virtue in the kingdom of God. And if you have a king, guess what you have to have? If you have a kingdom, I mean, you have to have a king. And so the New Testament, you know, one of the main texts about Jesus is Psalm 110.1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand, tell him make all your enemies, you know, your footstool. And so there's language of monarchy there. Psalm 2, Jesus is the king. He's Yahweh's anointed one. 1 Corinthians 15, Christ is going to be submitted to the Father for all eternity. Jesus taught again and again his disciples about the importance of washing feet, being in submission, submitting to one another, all those kind of things. And so part of the reason this is really bothering a lot of contemporary Christian interpreters, part of the reason, not the only reason, part of the reason is we have just been so influenced by our democratic values that we think the cosmos was created to be a democracy that the universe was created to function democratically. Now, I am delighted I live in a democracy, and I appreciate the values I have of that, but I don't want to confuse for a minute this experiment with democracy we have at this little time in world history with what the nature of the kingdom of God is. And in the kingdom of God that has this you know, world view that is the value and virtue of submissiveness, that includes men and women participate in this virtue. Jesus participates in this virtue of submissiveness. Okay, so I think that's where the beginning of this is, and that's the value of some of this. So um, Paul is saying that when they get together, men and women are together, 
Um, and this is the way some of them are dressing. It's, it doesn't care how they dress when they come to church. Right? It's when they pray and prophesy. And the ones who were slaves, and, and Roman historians think about 30% of the empire was composed of slaves. You didn't really go to, go to your closet and say, well, I wonder what I wear to church this morning. Right? That about third of the church membership, uh, they wore, if they got to go at all, to some kind of Christian assembly. Uh, they sort of put on the rags, if that's the kind of slave they were, that the, the uh, owner let them have. And some of them, by our standards, would be pretty indecent. Because literally it was just threadbare. Okay? And then you have some slave owners who've got some pretty nice clothes. But Paul's not talking about all that. He's just talking about, you know, when somebody's praying, man or woman, or prophesying. Now, let me say something briefly about what prophecy was and wasn't, as far as we can tell. So, um, because some people have said, okay, so prophets in the Bible, they are sort of the people that bring a message from God, and we clearly have women prophets in the Bible, no question about that. The day of Pentecost says you will, right? Church of Christ believes in the day of Pentecost, right? Acts 2, it's our chapter. So your sons and daughters will prophesy. And so um, 1 Corinthians has them. Uh, Acts 21 has them. You know, Philip, the evangelist, four daughters who are prophetesses. So, and of course there are women prophets in the Old Testament and life of Jesus. Got a couple of them there. Anna, okay. So people said, well, you know, prophets, prophetesses bring these messages from God, and that's what our modern preachers do. Ipso facto, we should have women preachers. I just want to slow down just a little in that sort of logic. Um, prophets in the Old Testament were not charged by God with being the people who regularly brought God's word. And what was God's word? God's word in the Old Testament it was the law of Moses, right? That's what you dealt with. The, sort of the Bible you dealt with for people with the law of Moses. And you said, well, I have all this prophetic material. Those are the people God was using to tell all the backsliding Jews you need to get back to Moses. Okay, that's what the prophets were about. If you just read the prophetic messages. You know, Jeremiah 7 is a classic example where he's gone to the you know, gate of the temple and he's preaching and the things he's saying is, is you're not keeping the two sort of focus, focal points of the Ten Commandments. You're worshiping foreign gods and Baal and everything and you're mistreating the widows and the orphans and you're shedding innocent blood and these kind of things. You're stealing, cheating. Okay, so the prophets are there basically to bring people back through these oracles to bring people back and sort of have them really drink deeply from the well of, of the Ten Commandments and Moses. So I want to just look at some verses here that contrast, and you can do this on your own. Can you all see that? Is that large enough? Yeah. Uh, so I thought once upon a time, I wonder what the Old Testament says about uh, who is supposed to actually be the teacher of God's people, not these sporadic people who get prophecies, sporadic prophecies, who regularly are supposed to teach God's people from the law of Moses? And sure enough, it's the priests. Okay? And so, um, 2 Kings 17, 27, Then the king of Assyria commanded, Send there some of the priests whom you carried away from there. That would be from the northern kingdom. Remember, there was a civil war, 922, 722, the Assyrians took them away in the north. <clears throat> okay. Stand, uh, send there one of the priests whom you carried away from there let him go down and live there and teach them the law of the God of the land that is teach them the law of the Jews uh, Second Chronicles 15.3 for a long time Israel was, was without the true God and without a, te without a teaching priest okay. um, Jeremiah 2 the priest did not ask where is the Lord those who deal with the law did not ask me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal, following worthless idols. So there's a distinguish between who the priests are and who the prophets are. are. Jeremiah 18, 18. They said, come, let us make plans against Jeremiah, for the teaching of the law by the priest will not be lost, nor will counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. Okay? Uh, Ezekiel. Right? Calamity upon calamity will come, and rumor upon rumor. They will try to get a vision from the prophet. 
the teaching of the law by the priest will be lost, as will the counsel of the elders. Uh, Ezekiel 22, 26, the priests have done violence to my teaching and have profaned my holy things. And it goes on and on. Malachi 3, 1. I'm sorry, Micah, Micah 3, 1. The rulers give judgments for a bribe. The priests teach for a price. Its prophets give oracles for money. So you can do this kind of study yourself. I'm just saying if you will notice in the Old Testament that it's basically the priests, because where are the people supposed to come all the time in the Old Testament? This is before there's a diaspora. Uh, you come to the temple all the time. You come to offer sacrifice. You come to the place where God has made his name to dwell. And that's where you would also, besides the idea that priests are just there to butcher animals and offer up sacrifices, that is a caricature of what their job is. They also have the duty and responsibility of being the people who deliver the theology that comes from God's word, which for their day and age was basically the law of Moses. They're the ones that did that day in and day out. They're supposed to, day in and day out. So we fast forward to our day and age, and we don't have exactly all the verses we wish we did about located preachers, right? And the people we pay these salaries to in our churches. We do know early on, Paul says, Galatians 6, right, 1 Corinthians 9, that paid people to deliver scripture to you. That's a noble thing, right? In fact, Paul says it's required. You're supposed to do it. It's a command of the Lord to do that, to pay people who bring the word to you. Um, so the people who do that in our churches typically are more like, okay, the priests, not in offering animals, but in having that responsibility from God to be in charge of bringing the word. And as you and I know in the Old Testament, while we have women prophets, we don't have women priests. There aren't any women priests in the Old Testament, at least not that are sanctioned. There are women prophets that are sanctioned. And so the jump from saying, well, you know, we had women prophets in the Old Testament and we should have women preachers, that's just really superficial jump, in my opinion. Um, now, certainly Paul teaches that all Christians, men and women, should get divine, transcendent insight from God through his spirit. And uh, I think women can share that. Okay, uh, That's not the same as the person who is sort of the regular voice along with the elders that the congregation looks to for sort of guidance for their teaching Okay, about God's will as it's revealed through his uh, word. Okay, and again, you can look at, there's a lot more of these, and you can look those up. If you just have some kind of concordance, you can look those up. All right, so back to First um, Corinthians 11. So, these prophets and prophetesses in Corinth, they are giving messages not primarily about the future. And we learn in chapter 14 that Paul expects the congregation of the church and God in Corinth to evaluate the prophecies given by the men and women. He says it's up to you people to, to weigh these things to see if they're so. And that's exactly what God has been telling his people, you know, since Deuteronomy 18 at least, where Moses said there's going to be people who give prophecies and they're false prophets or they're not teaching you the truth. And that continues through the Old Testament, and it continues. Jesus talks about false prophets. First Thessalonians, Paul says, don't, des don't despise prophecy. Okay? When you get it, don't quench the spirit. When you get it, sort of evaluate it. What's good, you hold on to, you embrace. And evil, you shun. You shun the very appearance of evil. You stay away from the evil that comes from prophecy. And that's what he's talking about in that text in 1 Thessalonians 5. So this, this need of God's people to evaluate and not just believe everybody that opens their mouth and says, well, the Lord said to say this, is maybe telling the truth. So in Corinth, uh, these prophecies, since they can be evaluated pretty immediately by God's people, are typically not about the future. Okay, they're not about something that you can't know whether they're a true prophet or not for, you know, 25 years. Moses says you have people who are clearly false prophets who may get some futuristic crystal ball reading right. But Moses said the way you evaluate them is by the theological content. 
does this person who got the predictive element right, are they teaching you to go worship other gods? If they are, then you know it's not from Yahweh, because they're teaching you to go worship some other god. Okay, back to 1 Corinthians 11. So, the men and women are giving these prophecies. That's both accept, both is that acceptable to Paul. Both genders do that. Paul has no problem with that. Peter on the day of Pentecost said, your sons and daughters are prophesying. His concern is, is that the way they are doing it with the men having their heads covered and women having their heads uncovered is a, a visual reversal of the role about head matters that's in verse 3, where man is the head of woman and Christ is the head of man and God is the head of Christ. Um, so when you're working with Christians, like in Corinth, and you know some of them are going to argue with you. And Paul never imagined, you know, that would be his greatest fantasies if everybody in his church has got these letters and all said, yes, sir, just tell us more. We just can't wait to obey you, Paul. Uh, that was not the case. Okay? And Paul knows that. And here he says at the end of our section, right? Verse 16, if anyone is inclined to be contentious. Well, of course, there would be some people contentious about this teaching about the head coverings. And who would those contentious people be? They would be the Romans. Because nobody likes to be told they have to change their religious cultural practices, do they? Right? People don't like that. And certainly in the case of this Roman religious practice, they can say, this has been around for 753 years. Right? That's when Rome was established, about 753 B.C., that's a pretty long time, right? To knowing this is the way you're supposed to do it. And all of a sudden Paul said, no. And so he knows, okay, that for people who think about this as a unisex practice, it's going to be an uphill battle. And so he is given this argument about what's on your head that nature teaches you. And so there's a thing in here about hair length, and I don't think Paul is trying to have a tape measure when guys come into the, you know, assembly and said, okay, your hair is too long, you know, you can't come in, none of that kind of stuff. It's, he's, it, the issue is not hair length. He's looking for an argument about the length of your hair as something that nature teaches you, and what he needs to have, and he, he has it, is an argument from nature, which Roman people would accept, is that nature is not unisex, right? Nature is not unisex. It distinguishes between, a lot of ways is nature not unisex, but in this particular case, it's not unisex in the issue of hair length. Now, Paul is not dealing with DNA or biology or anything else. He's just talking about what everybody observes. You know, and everybody in the Roman Empire would tell you that something would be really profoundly flawed in the universe is just spiraling out of control if one night they all went to bed, you know, everything looking normal, and the next morning they woke up and all the men had really long hair and all the women were short hair or bald. They wouldn't say, oh, we got just new hair trends. They wouldn't say that for a minute. They would know that the universe was just disintegrating them before their eyes. And so Paul is saying, I want to tell you Romans who are contentious that are so big on this unisex practice that nature supplies an example that you will agree with me on that everything is not unisex when it comes to what's on the top of your head. Okay, so um, that all may seem strange to us because one reason we've misunderstood what these arguments are about in part. And secondly, what everybody thinks is important in their culture is not important to other people's culture. You know? And if you don't know that you have a culture, you're one of the worst examples. <laughs> you know, I mean, uh, sometimes it's hard to see our own cultural biases, you know, and that we have them. But all you have to do is bring in somebody from another culture. And they have these jokes about the way Americans are, or Americans have jokes about the way other people are that reflect those biases those people have in their culture. Okay? But in Paul's day, this theological issue of male leadership, which 
which he says in verse 3 goes back to creation, uh, prior to creation in verse 3, that this is intersecting a cultural practice in the church of God that has to be dealt with. <coughs> has to be dealt with. You know, and what those are depending, I mean, this is why you study cross-cultural things when you deal with churches and when you deal with, uh, just humans deal with anthropology and you deal with cross-cultural communications. That's why business, you know, uh, global businesses, international corporations spend an arm and a leg to try to get their people who go overseas to work to be sort of sensitized about how things do it in other cultures because they're about to spend a fortune sending Americans over to work in whatever culture and they don't want them offending everybody, you know, every time they open their mouth or have a practice. And just as an aside, I'm amazed how stupid our State Department and military can be about things it does overseas. And it's like, you know, you people in the military just need to go take a basic, you know, cultural anthropology for missionary course or something. I mean, it's just amazing the things they do. And it's like, and it causes great offense and damage you can't undo sometimes just because they were just so culturally insensitive about how people in another culture do things. And so if the head covering is not a big deal, that's not a surprise to you and me. Neither is the holy kiss, right? That's, that's one we just sort of let go. And, you know, foot washing and some other things. Um, but it, it, it is an example of a text where it, it's really important that we <coughs> appreciate studying verses in their context. It's important to not say, as I've seen some writers say, well, we can't know what's going on here, so we just sort of have the license to do what we want to with it. And that was, a real, that was their hermeneutical method. They said, we can't know what this is about, really, so we just have the freedom to do what we want to with it. Well, you know where that kind of <coughs> modus operandi leads. <laughs> you know, you can just do what you want with a verse hermeneutically. Um, uh, but it does, my own view is that certainly Paul, uh, behind all of this, is trying to deal with, and by the way, he's a Roman citizen, um, trying, to, trying to deal with a way in which um, values of the kingdom of God, and in this regard, male leadership, okay, is being uh, undermined perhaps innocently at times, but being undermined by values of the dominant culture, namely the Roman civilization. And certainly we in the modern church, everywhere, but we're, we're in the West, so I'll talk about the West, we have the same problem. Is there are these values of God that whether it's done innocently or not, are um, undermined by cultural assumptions and practices that we have. Okay. I'm going to stop right there. Um, and our time is about up, but I know the, you need to have a few minute break before the next speaker gets up here. So thank you for your attentiveness. Okay? And uh, the church where I attend, which is the White Station Church of Christ in Memphis, it is what uh, would be labeled a um, complementarian congregation in terms of their practices. And... Um, I'm not up here to promote that, just to let you know, like, well, if you believe this, what happens then? And um, it was a decision our elders made, and I certainly felt no discomfort in needing to leave it, you know, and it certainly seems to bear out sort of Paul's concerns um, to not abandon the fact that there is leadership involved in this word head, and that there is male leadership. Um, and in some churches, that manifests itself in what would be called a complementarian understanding. Uh, and they, they have, you know, you know, the elders uh, spent about a year and a half just praying and studying this, and then, you know, they just came to the decision, that's what we're going to do, you know, and went forward with it from there. And, of course, loss of members, as you do about a lot of things. Okay, thank you again. <coughs>